All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, thank you guys for joining the Council's uh, monthly webinar series for the month of February. We have uh, assembled a team from the Archery Trade Association to connect with you guys and just let you guys know what they're doing working on R3. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that you can ask questions throughout the webinar in the bottom right-hand chat. Um, we'll get we'll cover those at the end of the presentation uh, as to not rep, uh, interrupt the um, presentation as they're going, but we'll have about 20 minutes at the end to answer questions, um, and then we'll follow up uh, with a survey afterwards um, just to get your guys' thoughts on everything. But uh, today we have with us uh, Emily Beach. She's the Senior Director of Outreach and Education uh, with the Archery Trade Association. We have Dan Forster the VP Chief Conservation Officer, and we have Josh Gold, the Education Programs Manager. So they got a great presentation for us today, and I think we're going to go ahead and have Emily kick us off here. Okay, great. Thank you, Marty. Um, we're just, I'm just going to be talking about who the Archery Trade Association is, for those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, we are the Trade Association for the Archery and Bow Hunting Industry. What that means is that we represent uh, the industry within the federal government and, and, and we try to decrease business overhead, reduce taxes and government re regulations and things like that at that level. And Dan will get into that more as he covers his government relations items. But we also just overall want to grow the archery and bow hunting industry um, or participation within that. So that is really our government relations and outreach and education, that's what we do. But what people know us most for is our trade show. And so we run the archery and bow hunting trade show, uh, and we, it is a business-to-business, members-only trade show where retailers come to actually purchase products for their stores in order to run their stores throughout the entire year. A lot of trade shows nowadays don't do that. Um, we really try to embrace that and, and keep that as our as our main goal because uh, it's the, kind of the backbone of our of our industry there. But um, that's what people know us most for. We have over 600 manufacturers, over a thousand retail shops, and we also have distributors, sales representatives, and media members as well. Um, this past year, we did add government and nonprofit membership, and so if you've partnered with ATA in the past, you were automatically granted a government membership, but if you have not, just reach out to us and we'll, we'll start that process and get that going there. Um, so what we're going to talk about today and move into and what Josh and Dan are going to go over is just what we do to help grow participation and remove barriers so we can just uh, keep our members in business. And Dan, I'm going to hand it over to you. You there, Dan? You might need to turn off your mute there. There you go. Got it. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> um, yep. So, so I'm essentially state and federal government relations. Uh, coordinator and what that essentially means is that I am uh, the, the, the face of ATA when it comes to state fish and wildlife agencies on the government relations front which includes policy as well as federal governments but at its core what my job really is is to help our partners state and federal partners grow uh, bow hunting and hunting participation that's, uh, that's what I spend most of my time doing. So I'm going to cover just a couple of things that I've been working on uh, uh, towards that end. One of the big things that we have done in the past year and a half or so has been working with states on this issue of complexity of regulations. Until I dug into uh, some of the metrics involved in bow hunting equipment regulations, uh, I didn't fully understand the complexity. And uh, some of our members would come to us and say, hey, you know, it is, it is so difficult to understand regulations. And most of us, uh, I think, can relate to that in terms of hunting seasons and bag limits and where you can go and what you can do. But I'm talking here specifically about bow hunting equipment regulations. 
So we did a survey of all 50 states. We used information from the 2016 and 17 hunting seasons, and we looked at all different types of equipment metrics. And by metrics, I mean different things like, can you have barbed broadheads? Is there a boat length or broadhead cutting edge minimum or maximum? Uh, is there a broadhead diameter uh, regulation? And believe it or not, we looked at over 60 different metrics that one or more states regulate. And we framed all that up under three kind of categories. One was potential barriers to entry. And these included things like minimum draw weights. If your state has a minimum draw weight of 40 pounds, that has a different level of impact to customers than uh, those that maybe have a 30 pound minimum draw weight. Um, bow let off maximums is another one of those uh, metrics that we viewed as being a potential barrier, not only a barrier to entry, but a problem from a legal standpoint too. Some of the newer bows now, uh, have 90% let off, and if your state only allows 85% let off, then we're putting some customers that uh, aren't familiar with some of the detailed nuances of regulations in a bit of a predicament, and we certainly don't want to do that. And then we looked at uh, about 15 metrics that were uh, we, we termed as complexity, and these are things that were uh, just general in nature that added to the confusion. And I mentioned some of them, bar broadheads, bolt length, broadhead cutting edges, that kind of a thing. I'm not sure what happened with the view there, Marty, but. I think we're back. Okay, all right, we gotta go back just a little bit. Okay, so we looked at 15 of those complexity metrics, and then we looked at what we called outliers, and that's that's uh, regulation metrics where there were one uh, to, to four states that had this regulation, but the bulk did not. And we, we just coined them outliers. And so we framed all this up in, in a report. And just to give you an example of one of those metrics, the report made a description about every one of those. For example, arrow length minimum. It says most states do not regulate arrow length, but there are 11 states that do regulate minimum length of an arrow that must be used for hunting. And in those minimum lengths, states range from 18 to 26 inches. So you can see that's just one example of one of 60 uh, metrics where we have highly variable and confusing regulations. And while we are very specific on the biological end of things, there's not a lot of real information to dictate uh, whether you're, you should even have a minimum arrow length, and if you do, should it be 16, 18, 26 inches, or whatnot. So we framed all that up, and over the course of this past year, we actually put together state reports that were very specific. So uh, agency folks could look at that uh, report and see where you were in your state relative to the averages, where you had outliers, where you may have had uh, some overly restrictive regulations. And we put all, all of that together not to cast stones or say that one way is better than the other, but simply framed it up in a way that people could see their differences, see where, uh, where they buried. And that has caused a lot of uh, states to uh, do some introspection do some regulatory reviews, and, and uh, by and large, we've gotten very positive feedback from that. I personally talked with, uh, I think, 50 state directors or deputy directors, uh, and hopefully many of you have heard about that, but I think it's a, it was a, a good effort to try and get folks to reduce some of the complexity, and we're seeing some of the fruits of that now. And, and the final thing I'll say about that is, even if you have a state that has very conservative regulations and they're easier to understand, in, in nine out of 10 cases, they were not presented in a way that was such. And so we provided some models there for people to, uh, to be able to talk. So uh, that's, a, that's one of the big things. The other thing we've been working on is uh, uh, recruitment and retention funding initiative. This is PR modernization legislation, which we had introduced last year. 
for the first time uh, because of a lot of reasons it didn't uh, go anywhere. But in uh, in this year's session, uh, we are uh, we're making some traction. We actually have a hearing on this beer bill scheduled in the House Natural Resources Federal Land Subcommittee on Thursday. So we've been working to get the testimony lined up, uh, and I'll have a chance to go up there, and uh, hopefully we'll have some positive uh, outcome from that hearing. Now, this particular piece of legislation is important because it does, in fact, modernize PR modernization, uh, the modernize the PR uh, Act in three very important ways. First, it removes a restriction of states to be able to use PR funds for marketing. Uh, those things that promote actually uh, hunting participation, which is a significant issue for uh, most states, especially those that don't have alternative funding. Um, as most of you know, you can spend some of the PR money out of one of the smaller pots to uh, build ranges, but uh, it has to be tied to hunter education. So you can't use money from the larger pot, and you can't build a range uh, just because you need to provide opportunity in a particular part of your state. So this would change that. And the last thing it would do is it would add $5 million to the multi-state grant program uh, that uh, you're familiar with that AFWA administers. And this would take $5 million from the archery excise tax, put it into that fund, and earmark that fund for competitive grants that contribute to the R3 effort. So it would be national and regional uh, priority programs, initiatives, pilots, uh, all geared towards growing hunting uh, and shooting participation which would be a huge uh, bonus for us to collaborate uh, and get some funding for some pretty neat programs collectively. And it would also provide uh, entities like the Council to Advance Hunting Shooting Sports to be able to compete for that money to uh, implement their programs, uh, perhaps through revisions to the national plan and so forth. Another thing that we're doing uh, that we actually did this past year is we're trying to be more strategic about working with states and growing uh, participation through re-engagement of bow hunters and other hunters and preventing some folks from lapsing. So we're doing, doing that by working with states uh, that have fairly robust licensed database systems where we can segment those licensed participants, send them emails, and we did that this past year in concert with uh, responsive management, and we sent uh, a variety of social images and different messages. Uh, we had aesthetic images, hunting recreation images, hunting success images, and uh, uh, put those into a couple different timing strategies. And we uh, partnered with the states of Florida, Georgia, Indiana, New Jersey, and Oklahoma on this campaign. And all those states sent out uh, those variety of emails this past fall. We're in the throes of uh, compiling the results of that information. We don't know exactly what the lift was, if there was a lift, and which one of those themes or timing strategies worked best. But uh, we hope to have the information from that that we can share in the next few weeks, if not months. And we've, we're taking all that information, and we're going to revisit it, revise it, and with the help of a multi-state grant that ATA and Responsive Management got uh, in this last round of competition, we're going to identify a new group of states. So if any of you are interested in participating with us on this program, you can certainly send me a note, and we'll put, the, put you in the queue. Uh, but we're going to look at a, another uh, list of states. We're going to refine the messaging, the timing, based on what we've learned, and uh, then put this back out there again with another second round, phase two, if you will, of email marketing campaign. And hopefully from that, we'll learn even more that we can summarize all that information into uh, a toolbox. Uh, and once we develop that toolbox, then we'll be able to share that with states. That would include best management practices for uh, 
uh, what infrastructure you need. Unfortunately, there's uh, only a double handful of states that have a robust enough database that can communicate with an email system that can provide this level of customer engagement and analysis. But we know that the future is going to be brighter and many more states are going to uh, march down that path. And hopefully as they do so, what we learn from the current study and the multi-state grant study, we will be able to uh, put together and present in a way that hopefully uh, we can all be more strategic and provide some lift and not miss some of those easy opportunities that we perhaps have in, uh, in the past. So again, if you're interested, let me know, and we'll be glad to uh, put you on the list and communicate next steps when they get uh, appropriate. And the last thing that I'm going to mention is uh, CWD is certainly an issue that the Trade Association is uh, highly concerned about. Uh, its impact on deer hunting long term, the hunting participation, uh, is is important to our industry as well as the hunting industry in general. You guys know that uh, whitetail deer hunting drives much of the related economy that our association of members benefit from. And one of the things that we have done in addition to participating in all the policy dialogue uh, and uh, uh, hopefully advocacy is that we have uh, worked with some of our scent manufacturers, those folks that provide urine uh, and other products for hunters, we have worked with them to overlay a more restrictive set of constraints on their production facilities, on the processes for production, uh, and uh, all of this has been done in the hopes of utilizing some best management practices to close the holes that are in USDA's CWD certification program. Uh, most of the biologists and deer folks will say there's holes in that monitoring program because there's not a 100% uh, mandate for testing. When you have mortalities, deer can move out of facilities and you don't have to test them. Uh, there's not uh, enough periodic tests. The herds maintain an openness and they're still certifiable. And we've closed all of those loops in this program. Uh, again, so if you look on the shelf in your local retailer, or big box store, and you see that ATA check mark on a bottle of urine, uh, you know that it has taken uh, what's an already low risk of CWD introduction and taken that risk down uh, even lower. And we feel good about that because that uh, was something the industry did on itself. Uh, and uh, it has cost, cost them certainly lots of money, but we're overseeing that program. We do have a state oversight working group that we're working with so that we have folks looking over our shoulder telling us, yes, that's, uh, that's good implementation and good policies. So hopefully that will uh, that'll serve all of us uh, in the whitetail deer resource uh, good in the long run. And with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn that back over to Josh. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more into the programming side and some of you guys may have heard of these programs or may be implementing them and may, some may hear for the first time. So we want to just kind of touch on some of them. And for more information on any of these, just reach out, let us know, and we're happy to talk to you about it. Um, our Explore Bow Hunting Program, it's currently launched in about 22 states and then also through Fish and Wild, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and some other NGOs. Um, it's a program with 23 activities that's going to teach the skills of bow hunting, but you can also, as it shows there, get into other types of animal behavior, tracking, um, just depending on which activities are selected and taught. So it can be taught straight through with every activity, or it can be pieced together and mixed with other programs. It's designed as a next step program. There's not a whole lot of shooting in this program, but it is designed to complement a NASP or USA Archery type program where they're already shooting. Um, it is designed for 11 to 17 year olds originally, but with little to, you know, little improvements or little changes, it's easy to teach to anybody, um, any beginner trying to get into bow hunting or just getting closer to wildlife. Yeah, it does include a full curriculum packet. Um, 
So if you are not too familiar with bow hunting, but teacher wants to get into it, there's a media packet, um, equipment booklet. It also includes a student handbook that is designed for the student to take home with them. Um, it kind of reiterates lessons, but it's also a self-learning tool. So they can go home and keep learning more about it. I've talked to some students that take the book with them, read it in the tree stand, and learn more while they're out hunting. So it's a very versatile program and can be added to a lot of different things. Um, it's also been, with help from a multi-state grant, translated into Spanish. So there is a Spanish edition of the curriculum guide for instructors and the student handbook um, for the students. So just trying to make it more versatile and reach more audiences and make it more available. Um, Explore Bow Fishing was launched uh, just about a year ago. It is in its pilot phases, and we're working with several states and nonprofits to get this out there. It is also a next step program, so designed to uh, accompany any other shooting activity. Um, this one does have a lot more shooting um, in it than the Explore Bow Hunting does, but it gets the basic skills of bow fishing and um, all the things that go with it. So um, it also includes an equipment guide and about 15 activities. And so we are testing this, getting it out there, and um, kind of be updating as we go, but it goes through water quality, fish ID, and both programs have been aligned with uh, educational standards, so that is also available through STEAM standards as well as just outdoor skills and other programs. So that is, they're both out there um, and always looking for new, uh, new programs and new organizations that would like to start these programs. Uh, one thing I'd like to touch on with you is a program that's been going on for a couple of years, but it actually connects manufacturers with um, instructors. So this actually gets equipment straight from the manufacturer into instructors' hands and tested. Um, this program is designed to kind of focus on the group programming um, and then kind of geared towards youth and women as well to kind of increase the equipment base for those groups. Um, even a couple of years ago, it was not as robust as it is now, and it seems to be growing every year. So this program's there. Uh, they work with manufacturers directly, but also trying to tie with instructors in the field that could test this equipment. Uh, a couple more resources that have been created that are out there, the archery safety brochure. Um, and it does exactly what it says. It goes over safety of archery and um, accident rates compared to other sports and ways to make it safer. So if looking to get archery or programming in a new location or new school district, this would be very helpful. Uh, and then the archery park guide as well is available on our website. Um, anybody that's looking to get develop archery ranges and archery parks uh, gives some really good guides and how-tos as well as some case studies we are expanding on that as well as more and more states and organizations build new parks and learn new practices. So that is something as well that's out there. Um, and the links to that are all at the end of the uh, webinar, so you get, are available for you guys. Um, one thing ATA tries to do is partner and have very strategic partnerships. Um, we are not a very big staff, but through these partnerships, we can get programming to a lot more people. And some of these partnerships have been across the board. Some of the newer ones with Scholastic 3D Archery and NFAA are partnering with the educational programs that we have and getting it out there to their members as well. So we can really broaden the scope of what we're doing and who we're reaching and how we can help out. So some very strategic partnerships that we go into. Um, I'm just trying to grow archery and, and throughout the country and in all communities. Um, two more resources for you guys, and this will include an attachment at the end, so it'll get sent out to you how you can use these resources. But if you have not visited Archery 360 and Bowhunting 360, it is two websites. Everything archery and everything bow hunting, and Bowhunting 360 includes bow fishing, but articles, how-to videos, cooking recipes, 
across the board for beginners all the way up through, you know, the seasoned hunter that's just looking for something new or something to read and learn about. Um, lots and lots of content that's available for you guys to use. So please use it. It's there. It's been created. Um, that how-to attachment will tell you how to go through and actually either link it to your site or pull it directly from the site for you to use. So that will be sent with a follow-up for you guys to use and hopefully um, for you guys and as well as, you know, any students or the public. So um, kind of wrapping up with the industry and connecting us with the industry and R3. Um, ATA does, rep, you know, we have manufacturers, distributors, retailers. A lot of you guys have worked with them before, but just be creative and think outside the box. Um, many of them are looking to be involved either locally, statewide, or even regionally, uh, just depending on the program and what's needed. Um, I know in the past, a lot of the times, it's a lot of free equipment or discount equipment, and that's great, but they're there for a lot of other resources. Um, you know, purchases and repairs, fitting someone properly. Uh, a lot of them have spaces for classes, uh, ranges, teaching hunter ed classes. Um, there's a lot of different ways. And then also, and a couple other, the NGOs, NFA and S3DA are really touching on this, is that whole archery community and um, the mentoring that goes on around these shops and around these um, ranges. So something to really look at and partner with, um, really just going in with what your goals are and what theirs are as well and seeing how you guys can work together and really push forward and push the push new hunters along the pathway to sticking with hunting in the long term. So looking at the industry side and what that kind of translates into our members, um, yes, the end is going to be equipment sales and service and revenue. Um, that is their end goal. I mean, they have to to stay in business. If they are not there, then that's what keeps them there. So that is the end, but there are a lot of factors to do that, and that's increasing participation, um, creating, creating more knowledgeable hunters and more knowledgeable people out in the field. So it's there. That's part of their end goal, but it's not the only end goal is the equipment sales. And looking into... R3 and how we can, how ATA could help out some and um, depending on where we can help out and where we'd like to help out with everybody is, um, you know, just getting access and that's a lot what Dan was doing is reducing those barriers and providing more access for hunters. And, you know, online engagement, the 360 platforms, um, they have social media platforms along with them. But that's there, that's for you guys to use, that's for the general public to read and learn, um, and just create more information out there. Um, trying to help with range development, build new ranges, build access for that as well. Um, those strategic partnerships we really work with, and those partnerships that we work with, we would like to connect you guys as well. So if that is something we can make introductions or connections, that's what we're here for. Uh, that also goes for the industry side of things. If we can help out and make a connection locally, nationally, any way we can, um, that's what we're here to work with and get everybody involved in the end game of increasing participation and in hunting. So. Um, this is another attachment you guys will be receiving, but we started looking at some of our programs and resources and how they and help solve some of the threats that are in the national plan. Um, it's kind of what we've talked about, but in a different form that you guys can use, but this will be sent out to you guys as well. All right, when they get through that, I know it's a quick, quick overview, but we want to leave time for questions and um, if you guys want to discuss anything in more detail. I know there's a couple, but yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, start uh, rattling off some of these questions. So, yeah, thank you guys for the, the overview. Um, please, everybody, if you have questions, uh, now's your chance. Type them in the box, and we'll just kind of start going through them. So uh, the first question we got is, uh, how do we as a nonprofit join the ATA? 
So you can just um, you can contact uh, Josh or I, uh, and we'll get that process started. So it's just an application. There is an application fee of two hundred and fifty dollars. However, if you partner with us on a project, um, especially NGOs that have more of a national scope, um, we waive that fee. And so it do, we, you are put through a process. Uh, in, you have to meet certain criteria and all of that kind of stuff. But we we will work with you to, to try to get you to become a member. So just contact Josh or I and we'll, and we'll get that started. Great. And then you see their contact information right up on the screen there. So that's perfect. Um, next question, kind of a, a follow-up as well. Uh, how, do, how do nonprofits apply for the grants that you guys were talking about? Is that the multi-state grant? Or? I think it originally popped up with Dan's um, or the if, email. Yeah, I, I could speak to the multi-state grant real quick, but uh, that one is administered by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It uh, is funded by a $3 million off the top uh, insertion of, of PR dollars. And uh, the applications are typically reviewed at the September meeting. So in the March meeting uh, at the North American, the Grants Committee will approve national conservation needs. Those needs will outline the eligible criteria for grant applicants. APPLE will then uh, send out uh, information relative to the application process, and it involves a short uh, letter of intent uh, which outlines very briefly the topic and what you're going to do, and then they'll uh, review all those letters of intent and make a recommendation back to the committee members, probably in, in a, a May time frame. And those folks that were successful in, in getting a, a full proposal solicited then will be in competition for those dollars uh, that will be awarded in the September meeting. Uh, the, the good thing about the expansion of the $5 million means that we'll have a completely separate pot, a uh, large pot, to, to support uh, just R3 projects by themselves, because right now R3 projects have to go through the competitive process, uh, which includes funding the National uh, Fish and Wildlife Service survey uh, on hunting fishing participation, and a whole bunch of other things things besides R3. So hopefully we'll get uh, get a bigger pot to draw from with PR modernization when it passes. Great. Um, Blake asks, how, how does one get the Explore Bow Hunting program uh, started? Um, it'll vary a little bit depending on nonprofit or state, but just contact me as well and we can get that conversation started. And you know, get the curriculum in your hands. Great. Um, Sam asks, can you offer some advice on engaging industry partners in R3 efforts? Is there a model that you guys have found successful to get partners to engage? So I, I can take that one, but this one is a tricky question. No, we have not found a model that works. And how our membership is kind of set up is that you have retailers and then we have manufacturers. And the retailers are, are grassroots, community-based uh, members, and so we work a lot with them to get them to um, include have ranges in their stores and open them up to the public um, at, at a cost so they can make money on it, but have them open and do programming to help with recruitment efforts. Um, and we're moving into helping them guide them through the mentoring process as well. But those are retailers. Um, and then there are manufacturers. And that is something that in manufacturers, um, a lot of people have in the past just tended to see them kind of as a, a cash register. They would go to them for free equipment or for financial support. but our manufacturers are not really in that position to always do that. And so while they want to support their communities and the growth of the sport, they not necessarily always can do that, and that's not necessarily the best use of them or uh, the resources there. So, uh, But what ATA can do is we can work with um, 
our partners and, and with people and put you and connect all of you together and try to find the best fit for some of the problems that you're looking at. If you're going to start to build your R3 plans and start having meetings, we can contact our members to, if you want them engaged, we can contact them and, and hopefully get them engaged and get them connected with you so they can become a part of those meetings and all of that. But there is no, we can't find, we have not been able to identify like a pathway yet for them uh, to be directly involved with our three efforts. And as each state develops their plans, we'll link them in as best as we can, but we'll work with, with everybody to do that. I don't, Dan, do you or Josh, do you guys have anything else to add or is there something out there that I am forgetting? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Emily. No, and from experience, it's just like other partners. Some are going to be very easy and kind of ahead of the curve of already doing programming, um, already running sh classes out of their shops or uh, local ranges. Some may already be partnering with a Parks and Rec or a state agency, and then some other some may not have the means to do that. So there, it's very across the board. But yes, we can help make those connections, and sometimes it's just a conversation of how they can help out and you know how you guys can work together. Great. Uh, Dean is asking, uh, he, he doesn't know that he's ever seen national bow hunter or bow angler numbers uh, or trends. Does ATA track these numbers of uh, bow hunter and bow angler, anglers nationally? Uh, if so, what are the trends looking like? Maybe compared to the overall national hunting and fishing trend. So I'll take a stab at this one. ATA uh, does not track bow hunter numbers ourselves. Uh, we're, we're very interested in those numbers, and we draw from some of the sources that do produce numbers, and there are some that are out there. Uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation uh, presents some of that data in their industry report. Uh, there's also the National Sporting Goods Association, which does a, a national survey. And then uh, I think uh, Archery Business Magazine puts out periodically uh, a kind of a tally of bow hunting licenses uh, that they get from states. The problem with all that information is it's got, it's got some, uh, some challenges with it, like most data, and the biggest of which is the time. Uh, I wish I could tell you that we have a uh, really good source of information for bow hunting participation. But the reality, that's going to come from the states. And most states don't have timely bow hunting uh, participation numbers. Uh, there's many states that don't require even a, a separate bow hunter uh, license, which is how most states kind of, uh, I guess, tally that at a very coarse level. Uh, but that's not always accurate because you throw in sportsman's licenses, which give folks the privilege. And it really, it really is tough. One of the things that I'm hopeful is that uh, with this uh, evolution of data dashboards that states are gravitating towards, uh, that that will solve some of that uh, issue. Uh, there was another multi-state grant awarded to ASA, the American Sport Fishing Association, and uh, ATA was one of a number of partners on that grant uh, that are providing some of some of uh, the partner funds for that effort. But we're hopeful that we can see uh, a number of states in the next uh, 12, 18 months uh, follow what, uh, what, as you know, Dean, Utah has been working on, Oregon has been working on, and others that will hopefully give us ability to have some more timely information. Uh, the best deer hunting information overall that I know of is done by QDMA, and they're not really tracking bow hunter information, but even when they publish their report, which they're about to publish uh, the next report in the coming months, it's actually from the 16, 17 season. So unfortunately, we got to get a lot better at the data, and ATA would get it if we could get it quicker, but the only way we can get it quicker is if we do a national survey, and uh, it's just, it's just too resource intensive for us to do that. So we'll continue working in concert with the states, hopefully to get better information. But uh, I do have some of that industry information, Dean. I'm happy to send to you what I do have. Great. 
it sounds like Dean, if you can just reach out to Dan afterwards, that can get you some of that. Uh, Tim asks, what are the chances of the PR update bill passing Congress this year, or what do you guys expect to be the uh, time frame that you're expecting it to get passed, if or if it is even to get passed? So my crystal ball probably is not much better than anybody else's, and unfortunately, you know, Congress is driven by lots of other things, government shutdown and, and budget control, and so I, you know, I don't, I don't really have an answer other than what my gut tells me. Um, what I can say about it is that uh, the fact that we have it uh, in front of a committee is uh, is exceptionally good news because we've got lots of friends once it gets out of committee, uh, lots of supporters, lots of friends, including uh, the speaker who's an avid bow hunter, that we think we can get it perhaps on a consent calendar on a fast track. Uh, and if we can get it out of the house in, uh, in a reasonable amount of time, which it could be, it could be a matter of weeks uh, or it could be uh, stalemated. Uh, but if we can get it out of the House, we've got uh, got things lined up pretty well in the Senate uh, that uh, I think there's a lot of support there. The problem with uh, congressional and even state-level politics, though, is um, most things can ca get caught up not because of their standalone, uh, I guess, uh, changes or their merit, but because uh, folks want to wrap this into larger bills, and then there's something in larger bills that tend to drag it down. So... So I, I don't know. Optimistically, we could get this thing done in the in the next uh, four to six months. Uh, realistically, uh, it's probably going to come down to the very end of the session, and the fact that it is an election year means that uh, boy, it's going to be tough. If we got to push this thing to eleventh hour, uh, it's going to be tough. But I, I would get it, give it a better than than fifty fifty chance uh, myself. Great. Um, how do you guys calculate bow hunter numbers in states that don't have bow hunting specific license or tags? So, I guess I can I can take that, but there's a couple of Georgia folks I think on the call, but I can I can tell you from the experience in Georgia, and I think it's consistent across the board. Uh, Georgia does not have a uh, bow hunting specific license. Uh, so what they do is they do a survey every year of the licensed hunters. And so they can determine what percent of those that hold a sportsman's license actually participated in bow hunting and what their harvest was. They can do the same thing for all the license types. And so at the end of the day, uh, they get pretty good statistically valid information not only on participation but also harvest. That is their core methodology for uh, determining harvest, or it has been for the last several decades. And uh, and now they've got a check-in system that kind of uh, they can compare that with. But it's uh, it's simply a scientific uh, survey met methodology that one can employ to get those numbers. Great. Um, what does the industry want <clears throat> us to measure to show them that you're valuable to their future? So is this the, um, um, the nonprofit? Is this specific to nonprofits? I wonder if I can ask that. Back. I'm assuming, yeah. So, the, so um, <laughs> I do not have to answer this question, so Josh and Dan, please feel free to pipe in. But um, the the industry does value everybody um, and, and sees value in partners, in nonprofits, in tournaments, in conservation organizations. Um, you know, the industry right now really relates well with itself. Um, so what I mean by that is that it relates really well to people who are already shooting archery and bow hunting and bow fishing. And so they so you're everything that every all of you are doing is valuable to them. It is it is our job as the ATA to connect 
all of you together. And that is something that we're going to be working on to, to improve. But so they do value everything. And I don't think that they value one thing over the other. It, recruitment really is the key. So if we're looking at it in R3, recruitment is, is, is the must have because we're losing uh, participants faster than we can replace them. And so from a business standpoint, they're losing customers and they're not getting new ones. And so, so the end result is they're not going to be in business for very long. So that's what, they, what their focus is on. They're not very good at recruiting and opening up their doors to new customers, but they're, we're working on that. And so, so everything that you do, especially with our industry right today, reactivation efforts are key. And so they're very supportive of that. And uh, mentoring opportunities, that's our next big step. That seems to be the next big gap. Um, but any recruitment efforts across the board that, uh, that we see. I don't know, Dan or Josh, do you have anything else to add? Well, I, I would just add that, um, you know, I, I'm not sure our industry is necessarily, you know, keeping score with anybody. So m measurements are good, but, you know, what we're mostly interested in is, uh, is bow hunting, participation, and related expenditures. And uh, if we can improve on, on getting and monitoring that, I think our industry would be light years ahead of where we are now. But, but even beyond just uh, that core interest, when you start talking about initiatives and programs that all contribute to the future of uh, what we're supporting, things like CWD and uh, participating in policy and weighing in on those discussions, uh, uh, PR modernization, you know, having NGO support, letters of support, playing in some of the arenas like AWCP, TRCP, and, and those kind of groups, seeing, seeing where there's commonality and support for all of the different tenants that contribute to a secure future, I think uh, is, is right in line with what we'd certainly like to see our value-added partners support. Great. Uh, looks like we've got a couple more questions. We're coming close to the end. We're going to try and get all of them in here. Um, can we, all right, let's see here. We got one up here. Um, Blake says he's the shooting sports coordinator for the state of Utah 4-H. Does the Explore Bow Hunting program, can it be partnered with 4-H? Has anybody done that before? Um, yes. On a national scale, it has not been, but yes, it can easily go with it. Um, just from experience, when I was in Florida, we partnered with several 4-H clubs, and um, it fit very well with what they were doing. I know they already have a shooting sports program, so either activity would be a really good, you know, next step and keep their students interested. So, yeah, I think it would. it's a very good fit. just hasn't been on a, a national partnership, so. Yes, we can definitely get that partnered up and get them going. Great. Um, last question here. Can they utilize, can nonprofits utilize data dashboards uh, to include their information to provide to you guys or to provide folks using the data dashboards? I'm assuming states. So I, I think the concept with the data dashboards is that each state agency would accumulate and post their information on some periodic uh, time frame, be it, be it monthly or quarterly or semi-annually. And it would be the bulk of the information they're collecting from uh, their, their efforts related to licensing and perhaps including harvest. harvest. So, uh, so those could all be rolled up into a central, regional, or national database so you could look uh, three months after uh, hunting season and see what the trends were relative to others. So in, in that vein, I think the current data dashboards and their concepts are, are focused on state data, but uh, I think um, there's an opportunity uh, to enter some of that dialogue with the states as they're developing 
that. And if there is some national level interest, then I know the partners on that uh, program would be interested in hearing what your thoughts are, what kind of information would be rolled up. Uh, and of course, ASA is taking the lead on that, but it does involve Samantha and the council and ATA and others. So you've got a link there. I think there's some contacts embedded in that. And uh, I'd throw your, your thoughts on that into the uh, into the fray, and, and if they have merit and value, then uh, I think they'd be included. Great. <clears throat> um, so we had a couple people post some, uh, we were talking about the numbers of uh, <clears throat> archers in, in, in the nation and whatnot. Some people posted some link to some consensus data, it looks like. Um, but uh, Frank had a question about uh, if we're going to post all of this to the website or uh, somewhere. Yes, we will. We're going to post this webinar to YouTube and then to the uh, nationalr3plan.com. Um, if you have, uh, if you RSVP'd to this webinar, we have your email, so we'll send out a follow-up email uh, with a survey and with the documents that Josh had uh, kind of gone over in his uh, presentation. Uh, we'll include all that in the on the um, the when we post the webinar to the R3 community. We will also attach those documents there. So um, if you if you didn't RSVP and you want that email right away, just uh, email me or Sam. Uh, my email is Marty at powderhook.com. Sam's is Sam at c a h s s dot org. Uh, just email us and then uh, we can shoot those to you. So. Um, if there's no further questions, uh, we're about five minutes till 2 p.m. So, uh, oh, it looks like we had one more come in. Uh, how is ATA uh, Explore Bow Hunting partnering with Scholastic 3D Archery? So, um, it's a, go ahead, Josh. It's a newer partnership, but the currently F3A does have some bow hunting education side, um, but they will be adopting the Explore Bow Hunting program as well. So their clubs and their instructors will have access to the Explore Bow Hunting um, as well as the bow fishing curriculum. And that's how it's going to initially get out there. And um, typically we've implemented Explore Bow Hunting and Bow Fishing through the state agencies and it's become their program and they take off with it. Um, we're also exploring different op options through Salvation Army Outdoors and some of those other partners, and Classic 3D Archery is one of those. I'll let Emily if awesome. you have anything there. Nope, you got it. All righty. Sounds like, or looks like, that's about all the questions we're going to get for the day. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, Tune in next month for uh, March's March, uh, monthly webinar. And Dan, Emily, Josh, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, it's very useful information. Please take the survey that we Sam had posted in the chat box. Uh, we'll also um, close out the, the webinar and it'll open for you to take. Uh, we just want to make sure we're, we're on topic for you guys. We want to get some feedback, provide our presenters some feedback so the next time they talk about this stuff, they can hit on, you know, some of the more important stuff and whatnot. So uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, presenters. Have a great rest of the month. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, guys.